Russian forces appear to be regrouping for a possible assault on Kyiv. New satellite images from US company Maxar Technology show military units deploying closer to the capital. According to the company's analysis, the images show artillery firing towards residential areas as well as burning homes and other buildings. Widespread damage and impact craters can also be seen in a town northwest of Kyiv. And concern is also growing over the besieged southern port of Mariupol. Ukrainian officials say more than 1,500 people have been killed. Barrages into the city have thwarted repeated attempts to bring in food and water and evacuate trapped civilians. And authorities in Ukraine have released CCTV footage they say shows Russian forces apprehending the mayor of Melitopol, Ivan Fedorov. Ukraine says Russian forces kidnapped him after falsely accusing him of terrorism. And meanwhile, Russia is expanding its military campaign across other parts of Ukraine, intensifying attacks on cities and hitting new targets with bombs and missile strikes. The city of Dnipro in eastern Ukraine, a new front in Russia's war. Emergency services said at least three missiles hit civilian targets here, including this shoe factory. For Ukraine, another sign that Russia is deliberately targeting civilians. We see more destruction of civilian infrastructure, murder of Ukrainians by a terrorist state, the Russian Federation. Russia also launched attacks on Lutsk and Ivano-Frankivsk, two cities in western Ukraine far from the main battle zones. The Kremlin unilaterally announced humanitarian corridors in places including Mariupol, Kharkiv, Cherneviv and Sumy. The first residents of Sumy who managed to flee via one of the corridors arrived in the western city of Lviv. I've seen planes fly over us and bomb our street several times. It was horrible. I took the kids and hid. They bombed our streets, our buildings, our homes. One of the bombs killed 22 people, three of them children. The whole family died. Outside the capital, Kyiv, Ukrainian forces continue to battle Russian troops. Ukraine says military victories here have stalled the Russian offensive on the city. President Volodymyr Zelensky sounded a defiant tone. It's impossible to say how many days we still have to free Ukrainian land. But we can say we will do it because we want it. We have already reached a strategic turning point. We are moving towards our goal, towards our victory. In central Kyiv, Air raid sirens rang out again. Russian forces are within striking distance. The battle for Kiev will be decisive in the outcome of this war. And for more, let's bring in DW's correspondent Nick Connolly, who's in Kiev. Nick, air raid sirens were heard again in the morning. How was the night there? Well, I think air raid sirens just are part of daily life, not only in Kiev, but in most big cities. Over in Ukraine now, we're in the third week of war. And to be honest, lots of people have given up going down to their cellars, finding a metro station every time they hear it, because basically you couldn't get a look, get through your day without spending most of your time hiding. There are so many of these because some lots of these rockets are coming from Belarus, which is very close. So the system is not able to identify immediately which city, which direction those missiles are going. So basically all cities in the kind of broader area that could be hit have those sirens. So basically uh, it's pretty unspecific and uh, yeah, obviously terrifying when you hear that, when you hear it on the ground, when you hear it on the radio, when you're driving around the town. Um, but I think it's something that lots of Ukrainians have got used to. We have been hearing some big bangs. It's difficult to tell what they are. Sometimes those are uh, anti-aircraft systems working, um, knocking out uh, rockets that are being heading, heading this way. Obviously, Kiev is one of the main targets, but also has some of the best anti-aircraft uh, facilities that Ukraine has. There have also been reports of Ukrainian troops blowing up bridges to the west in the direction of Irpin, that town that we've seen thousands of people trying to get out of in recent days, trying to make it difficult for Russia to come in closer from that direction. So it is, it is, it is difficult, it is scary because you can't 
identify even people with military experience can't necessarily identify where those bangs coming from, what they are, but people are getting used to it because that is just their daily reality. And for the people that you meet here in Kiev, most of the kind of two million people estimated still to be here in Kiev, they have made their choice that they're staying. Nick, with that said, does it seem or is it apparent that the Russians have rethought their strategy in the last 48 hours? Well, obviously, there's a lot of conjecture based on those satellite images that, for instance, the Russians here closer to Kiev are, on the one hand, spreading their hardware more thinly because there have been lots of attacks by Ukrainian drones, Ukrainian aviation on areas, on places where the Russians had concentrated their forces, so basically made it easier for the Ukrainians to hit them from the air. Then there's other uh, conjecture and also analysis that the Russians are now using more missile strikes, missile strikes coming from Belarus or from further afield from Russia proper, um, because the Ukrainians are proving to be quite successful on the ground when it comes to kind of direct combat on the roads in the villages of Ukraine, uh, those Western weapons that Ukraine has been receiving in recent months, those anti-tank missiles, those Stinger anti-aircraft missiles are proving quite effective. So the Russians trying to ram home their advantage in those parts of kind of military hardware that Ukraine can't match Russia on. Um, but I think for now, it's it's too early to tell. Yesterday evening, people were very worried here that the Russians were going to bring Belarus into this. So for now, Russian forces have been using Belarusian airfields, have come in from Belarus, but they haven't used the Belarusian army yet and there was worry yesterday here in Ukraine that the Russians would organize some kind of false flag operation that would seem to be Ukraine attacking Belarus as a pretext for Belarus to come into this war on Russia's side. That doesn't seem to have happened overnight but it's very difficult to tell what exactly is happening. There are very few independent journalists on the ground exactly where the fighting is. There's censorship, military censorship on both sides but uh, yeah for now there is a worry that the Russians are now regrouping and trying to prepare some kind of assault on Kiev given that it's proven so difficult for them to capture Ukraine's capital in the recent days. Nick, just briefly, do we know anything about the fate or the well-being of Melitopol's mayor, Ivan Fedorov? Well, these have been extraordinary pictures from cities in southern Ukraine that are now under Russian control of civil resistance, unarmed resistance, people going out and protesting, getting on Russian tanks with the Ukrainian flags and basically just saying, we don't want you here. And the same goes for the mayor of that city who has refused to go along with what the Russian forces want him to do. We've seen images yesterday that seem to show him being kidnapped. And there is a demonstration planned in that city today, this morning, uh, by locals to demand his release. It's very difficult to get in contact with people there because mobile phone networks are down and there are you know, issues with c connectivity, but it does seem that uh, he is in Russian custody and uh, the locals, at least lots of them, are willing to take the risk of standing up to those Russian forces in their city to demand that their Ukrainian uh, democratically elected mayor be released and be allowed to do his job. The W correspondent Nick Connolly in Kiev. Thank you. We're joined now by Klaus Wittmer. He's a retired Brigadier General of the German Armed Forces. Welcome to you, sir. The, I want to begin by asking if you expect this increasingly heavy bombardment of Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities to continue, if not escalate, in coming days and weeks. Absolutely. Uh, as we see, that is the change of strategy across the board. The land campaign has been slowed down to an unexpected extent, and uh, so uh, they will uh, uh, increase the bombardment uh, of the cities and particularly uh, Kiev. Uh, as we uh, see, uh, the uh, uh, Russian military is still trying to encircle the uh, city, uh, the capital, but with limited success. As your correspondent has described, the troops are regrouping, artillery is in position, but I think uh, entering the city in strength is still far off, uh, also because the defense preparations uh, by the Ukrainians are very strong in personnel, in uh, block uh, barricades, in traps, in uh, anti-tank arms and anti-air uh, uh, systems, and all this led by the charismatic uh, president who uh, motive and the Klitschko brothers so who motivate the whole nation. Right. The limited success you speak of, Russia is one of the biggest military powers in the world, but it has been tested here before the eyes of the world. Has it passed that test for you? Can you repeat the question? I'm just saying uh, Russia is one of the biggest armies in the world. They've been yeah, tested that, here. Have they passed the that test? Have they, have they misjudged, you mean? Have they... 
is their army performing well? Well, uh, I think um, apart from the misjudgment regarding Western unity, uh, international shaming and isolation and sanctions, uh, of course, uh, Putin uh, has miscalculated in military terms and totally underestimated the Ukrainian uh, resolve and uh, resistance. Uh, uh, the Kremlin thought of a, a subjugation blitzkrieg, as it were, but now we are on day 17 of the war with uh, limited advance. And for that, uh, logistical preparations over long distances were totally insufficient. Food, fuel, spare parts, etc. And there was also a misjudgment about the losses among the deplorable young Russian soldiers who have a very poor fighting morale and uh, motivation because uh, they were not prepared for fighting a war in a brother country. No flight zones over Ukraine have been discussed and, and seems to be set aside for fears of what Russia will do in response. Where do you think Russia's red line is for considering NATO support for Ukraine an act of aggression against Russia? Let me start by uh, saying that yesterday in a, in a webinar, a former secure general Breedlove uh, criticised how we are totally deterred by Putin's tempers. Indeed, for this criminal aggression, he constructed the pretext all by himself and does not need our provocations. On the one hand, of course, a no-fly zone would mean that NATO planes shoot down Russian planes over Ukraine territory. That would indeed lead to a war between Russia and the United States that must be avoided. On the other hand, mm -hmm. MiG-29 from Poland for Ukraine, I found uh, totally acceptable. But the operation was sadly spoiled by harmful public debate. One should, have not have, one should not have talked about it in the public by night. One should have changed the national emblems. Uh, Ukraine, uh, um, Ukrainian pilots would have come to the Polish airfield, uh, entered the planes and flown them to Ukraine and uh, with much, uh, without much ado. Through the public uh, discussion, this mm -hmm. option was uh, aborted, so to speak. Klaus Wittmann, retired Brigadier General, thank you so much for your thoughts. Thank you. Have a good day. Well, in the 16 days since the war started, the UN says more than 2.5 million people have fled Ukraine. Nearly half of them to Poland. DW's Birgitta Schulke travelled to the city of Pyszemyszel near the border with Ukraine and filed this report. After escaping the war zone, their train finally arrives in Poland. Hundreds of women and children disembark to safety at platform number five in Pyszemyszel station. Olga and her two children have been travelling for three days and freezing nights. They are exhausted but relieved to be getting help. Their house in Kharkiv was destroyed in a Russian air raid. They kept bombing us. It didn't stop. We had to take shelter in the bunker and we were trapped there for days. That's when we decided to flee. It was horrific. The children didn't stop crying. We tried to comfort them and tried to stay calm, but inside we were also shaken. They show us blurry photos of Kharkiv, their city in ruins. Their husbands are still there because they are not allowed to leave the country. Four-year-old Vanya doesn't understand why. I miss my daddy. We went on the train and we were going and going and going. In the entrance hall, hundreds of volunteers provide the new arrivals with food, water, clothes, free SIM cards and advice. Like Olga, many don't know where to go from here, nor what to do next. Every day, five to ten trains from Ukraine arrive here at the station and the number continues to grow. To help all the arriving refugees has become a major challenge for the small city of Przemyszel, which itself has only 60,000 citizens. The city's mayor, Wojciech Bakun, is coordinating the humanitarian relief effort. Since the war in Ukraine began, he says he hasn't had more than four hours sleep a day. He's proud that his city has managed to provide help, but is worried. 
He doesn't know how long they can keep it up. We are, we are the city hall, not, you know, humanity organization. So we will we, we not do this for a long time or for forever, you know, just we try to talk with some organization to help us for a long, long period of time. Key, he tells us, is to quickly relocate the refugees to other cities. Olga has finally decided to continue her journey to Warsaw. Before a train leaves, she addresses all NATO states. I want to tell them to impose a no-fly zone, because our families are still there. My parents, my brother, our husbands are there. I want my family to survive. I want the bombing to stop. Once in Warsaw, Olga plans to call her husband and her parents. She doesn't have the strength yet, because she's afraid they might not answer. For more, let's bring in Matthew Saltmarsh, currently in the southeast of Poland, close to the Ukrainian border. He's the spokesman of the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Welcome to you, Matthew. Just wondering first up whether you expect the flow of people out of Ukraine, 2.5 million of them so far. Do you expect this enormous flow of people will continue? Well, as you said, that number has now passed the 2.5 million barrier. It went through yesterday. Poland here is taking the lion's share, one and a half million, with also significant numbers around the neighboring countries, but also moving westward. As to whether it will continue, yes, there will be more people coming. The scale of that and the speed of that obviously depends very much on what happens on the ground in Ukraine, uh, intensification of conflict or not, um, safe passages out of cities, and whether people decide that it's not safe enough to move from the western part of the country um, and then and then cross the border so so those are there's a number of factors but of course the numbers will keep rising in the last couple of days the border that i've been at near here in medica has been a little bit quieter than it had been in previous days pretty clearly matthew these millions of people need a lot but what is needed most urgently right now well i think up on the border the immediate needs are obviously uh warm clothing blankets hot food that's being provided for uh, by NGOs by the Polish authorities so again we really have to have to thank them I think as more people come in and they are triaged out and away from the border the question then becomes more of reception and accommodation and secondary services around things like health and trauma support and child support and so on so initially, the Poles have done a fantastic job and uh, those spaces, that accommodation is there. As things move on, uh, the questions arise as to what will be the next steps. You allude to it. So far, the refugees are, are mainly in the neighbouring countries to Ukraine. Are there already thoughts or, or plans coming together about how they could be distributed throughout Europe? Well, obviously, that's a question for the European Union. Um, relocation has been attempted before by the EU in the Syria situation. Uh, there weren't huge numbers successfully uh, transferred into different states. Um, so we'll have to see, I think, what happens with the numbers that arrive in different states, whether those states have the capacity uh, to absorb them, whether they feel that other neighbours need to step in and take take some numbers. I think it's a little bit early to be speculating about that, but it, it's definitely something that, that policymakers in the EU will be thinking about at the moment. Matthew Saltmarsh from the UNHCR, thanks so much. Thank you. OK, here's a look now at some of the other developments in the conflict. And the International Atomic Energy Agency says power has been partially restored to Chernobyl nuclear power station, the site of the 1986 nuclear disaster. Ukrainian technicians say they are repairing the plant, which was seized by Russian forces early in the war. The power supply is critical to keep reactor rods there cooled. US troops continue to be deployed to Europe, adding to thousands who have already been sent to support NATO allies following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. About 130 soldiers left the US state of Georgia. The Pentagon has ordered roughly 12,000 service members from the US bases to Europe. 
Spain's energy and food prices have surged, with electricity more than doubling since before the Russian war on Ukraine. It has affected Spain's grain imports and driven up oil and gas prices. The Spanish Prime Minister has pledged subsidies to support those most seriously hit. Well, the EU summit in Versailles has been dominated by the conflict in Ukraine and the beleaguered nation's request for fast-track entry into the EU. The 27 leaders declined to alter the conditions for Ukraine to join the group, saying it will have to follow the procedure for entry. But they left the door to membership slightly open. Calls from some EU members to immediately stop Russian oil and gas were also unsuccessful, although there was agreement to move away from fuel dependence on Russia by 2027. Well, for more on that, I'm joined by DW correspondent Barbara Vazel in Versailles, where that informal EU summit took place. Barbara, the EU leaders decided on a big policy change on energy and defence here. Where's the biggest shift? This absolutely is a quantum leap for the European Union because they had to acknowledge that all their political doctrines, their ideologies and their beliefs throughout the last 10, maybe even 20 years were simply wrong. They thought that the world was a reliable place with their neighbours like Russia uh, being uh, closely tied uh, to Europe uh, by trade and by financial uh, ties. And this has proven to be horribly untrue. So their security is seriously threatened. So they have to sort of reformulate everything. Energy policy, it means that they will try to get off Russian oil and gas. They want to diminish it by two-thirds till the end of the year. Defense, they have found out and, and sort of really noticed that they are totally defenseless without American troops, that Russia could aggress, uh, have a, a war, start a war of aggression against them as well, theoretically. So they will now have uh, common defense projects. They know they will have to spend much more money. We're talking about billions uh, for defense of the member states and for common projects. So this is a just complete change in everything. And it is a hard thing to do. There were bitter and long discussions. Yeah, many things you're talking about will take a long time, but what was decided concerning further sanctions and a possible oil and gas boycott of Russia? Yeah, that, of course, is the elephant and was the elephant in the room here in the Chateau of Versailles behind me, uh, because this was talked about. When the Finnish uh, prime minister arrived here, uh, she said, uh, we are financing Putin's war by buying oil and gas from Russia. And she was totally right. And everybody in those luxurious rooms there knows it. But they said we can't do it yet. We somehow don't know how to tell our citizens that prices for energy will go through the roof. Now they're trying to sort of find intermediate measures, but we don't know yet. They might yet come to the point of things in UK, Ukraine get worse and worse, and if uh, Putin uh, sort of piles up atrocities against the Ukrainian people, they might find themselves be forced politically to cut off those uh, oil and gas deliveries. Just before we go, Barbara, Ukraine's hope of fast-tracked EU membership, is that hope all but done for? Yeah, that was a bit weak. It was a diplomatic formula. Of course, yes, you are part of our family and we want you and eventually you can come. But it didn't give them any in immediate hope and it didn't really put them on a fast track as a candidate, which was a, it would have been the first formal step. It was uh, to, to tell them that, yes, you can start to sort of uh, go towards uh, becoming a member of the European Union. And so this sort of like little ray of hope that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky had tried to give his people, the West uh, and Europe, they want you, they accept you, they will take you in. Uh, that wasn't really given to them. And uh, so uh, that was uh, much less than could have happened. Many Eastern European countries left here and said, we're disappointed this could have been better. Barbara Faisal in Versailles, thank you.